Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone out there, and welcome, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion on a complex set of issues that sit at the interface between data, technology, finance, and the delivery of agricultural services, and how the landscape for this is being reshaped by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm joined today by three distinguished panelists. You can find more in their backgrounds in the accompanying documentation to this webinar, but just very briefly. And Zetse Weir is a development economist with over 10 years of experience working in Africa on economic research, analysis, and strategy development. Over her career, Anzetse has worked with African governments, private sector, development finance institutions, nonprofit organizations, as well as academia and think tanks. She's currently an economist at FSD Kenya in Nairobi. Chris Brett is my second panelist, and he's a lead agribusiness specialist with the World Bank, based here in Washington, DC. Chris has had a number of very interesting roles in the international development space, which I don't actually have time to go into. He's done so many things. Uh, but he also worked for nine years as the global head of sustainability for a large multinational agricultural supply chain management company. As part of the senior management team there, Chris supported the company's transition from a trading-based company to a global agribusiness supply chain management company. And then my last panelist is Ferdy Meyer, who's based in South Africa. Ferdy grew up on a crop and livestock farm in the Northwest province of South Africa. After 20 years at the University of Pretoria, he became an extraordinary professor at the University of Stellenbosch in 2020. He was one of the founding members and the CEO of the Bureau for Food and Agricultural Policy in 2004, which is an internationally recognized as an independent think tank on the African continent, serving the agro, food, fiber, and beverage sectors. He specializes in agricultural market, trade and policy analyses, value chain analytics, strategic foresighting, and scenario planning. So as I said at the outset, we're trying to unpack this complex intersection between data, technology, finance, and agriculture, and particularly looking at it from the perspective of a COVID pandemic that's disrupted and suddenly accelerated the digitization of data and value chains. These changes have potentially profound um, implications for our agricultural system, but also for the smallholder farmers that operate at the base of these complex value chains. Today, we want to explore the opportunities that arise from this unique moment, as well as the gaps in the system the pandemic has revealed. What changes due to COVID will be embedded and will improve our sector in the future? And what are some of the risks that these new technologies potentially bring with them? So in starting, I'm going to ask each of my panelists to begin with a brief opening statement of five minutes, and then we'll move into what will no doubt be a fascinating conversation. So Chris, I'm going to start with you. Um, how do you see the emergence of agritech digital platforms facilitating transactions during COVID-19, and how can they generate data that will be used productively in the future? Where do you see the opportunities, and could you please mention some examples to help us sort of understand how this is playing out? Over to you, Chris. Yeah, great. Um, thanks. And it's, it's a real pleasure to join this panel in this conversation. Obviously, from the World Bank's point of view, th this is an incredibly important area. Uh, technology can bring transformation, it can bring challenges. And what we're seeing here that the COVID crisis has really accelerated the need for integrating, for linking smallholders to markets. At the beginning of the COVID crisis, we saw a lot of disruption um, in the value chains, uh, particularly around the perishable and fresh value chains. You know, many organizations, including the World Bank Group, we've heavily promoted you know, the production of nutritious fruits, nutritious vegetables for the market. And systems here have been working well until the COVID came along. And COVID had led to such disruption from getting the product from the producer to the market. So we're looking at here is a real challenge, particularly on the agro-logistics, as well as, of course, the finance. And what we're really pleased to see is that, that as a big response, I mean, through government's work, as well as the private sector rising to challenges, we've seen an awful lot of uptake in terms of e-commerce, number one. We've also seen a lot of transactions uh, happening where a lot of platforms have been in a very nascent stage where they were linking the smallholders to off takers. And a lot of those issues there, there was problems on transferring finance, information linkages and so on. But through bringing together you know, the different actors, the different stakeholders in the supply chain, a lot of those areas have, have sort of really shifted and moved. And we're seeing a huge uptake now of, of electronic transfers, you know, payments for product, as well as that linkage of products to markets. So the World Bank has been incredibly supportive of the government side and the linkage of the private sector. We've worked hard on trying to support government capacity to enable this area to happen. 
So lots of challenges, and there's a lot of dependency on technology and assuming systems could work well. I think a lot of our challenges are coming is, is really looking at ground truthing. You know, we still need to get out there and make sure things are moving, things are happening, and what we see on the platforms is the reality on the ground. So there's a lot of challenge in that respect. So really coming on to some of the examples, um, you know, a lot of support has been given to organizations like True, True Trade Africa as a specific example. This is a really fascinating platform uh, started in Uganda in Kenya, where it's linking the producers uh, to put products onto a platform where the off takers and processes can link to. And I think this is really, really critical. You know, they're giving the opportunity to really say to the out, you know, to the off takers, here is the product, bit of price, come and collect. And you know, like in summary, that's really working well. It's moving the moving the goods primarily as well as the finance. And already early examples are showing that smallholders are getting a 14% increase in the pricing of their products. And I think this is really important, bringing local value more to the producers. Um, you know, we're we're very much in supportive of the infrastructure we've been trying to invest heavily and uh, going forward as part of our you know coming back better program we'll be investing a lot more in the infrastructure supporting governments to develop the warehousing the cold storage as well as of course the um, the importance here of um, you know bringing the product through to actually reduce stroke eliminate waste at the beginning of the covid crisis there was a lot of waste in these products and now that waste levels are coming down so these are important but this is a system of taking it from the producer to the, um, to the processes of the off-taker and then of course into the market. I think what's interesting, we're seeing very, very strong examples in India uh, where you've, you've, we've now got producers who are in SME cooperative structures, which are really bringing that aggregation point together, defining their qualities, and then they're putting it on an e-commerce platform direct to the consumers. So these organizations have managed to invest very rapidly, not just in a platform, but in vehicles, you know, trucks to be able to get it direct to the consumer and even getting to doorstop delivery. So, so a lot of complexity within these organizations and working. I think the last thing I really want to stress here, we talk about technology and platform and the internet, but even where there is a struggle for the internet to really work, because there's an assumption these things move, um, we're also seeing really good innovation around the WhatsApp group. I think WhatsApp has really been transformational on data, you know, market information, setting up these groups. Uh, it's empowered a lot of the smallholders and the producer organizations to come together. And even if they're 20, 30, 40, you know, they can set up a gap, share information and link to market. So we've seen one called the Chambol Ag um, Agro Farmers Producer Company. It's a WhatsApp group that's been set up in... Uh, in India, and it's really now a really getting straightforward linkages to, to the consumer. And what's good is a lot of these organizations, they, they've managed to now connect because they build scale, they connect to service providers. So they can either invest in their own transport or they can contract you know, organizations, you know, service providers to support them through storage or through direct transport, building those hubs. So I think, I think huge opportunity. Um, I, I think at this point, it's still cause to acknowledge is to say, we're not going to go backwards. You know, the, 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 the whole thing about COVID, we really appreciate, you know, and are concerned about the, you know, the crisis and, and it's pushed people backwards. But as people come forward, we're looking for the positive side on how we're going to back the strong innovation. So I look forward to further questions. Back to you, Greta. Thank you. That is a great start for us. Thank you very much, Chris. There's a lot I want to dig into on what you just said, but um, let's turn to Anzetsi next. Um, and so, see, I'd like to um, turn our attention to sort of smallholder farmers themselves and how we sort of manage digital exclusion in smallholder agriculture data co collection. So COVID-19 is widening the poverty gap. And as the use of digital platform grows, how can these platforms support monitoring and engagement of smallholders themselves who might be excluded? So you know, we can look at this as though it's really great for the system, and, and it is. Um, but you also have people who are sort of feeding product into that system. Um, so who has access to these digital platforms? Are the smallholders able to access these platforms and do they have the requisite skill set and resources? If you could sort of share with us your thoughts on those questions. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I think there are really four things to bear in mind when looking at that from a smallholder perspective. I think the first is, what are the starting capabilities? And I think if you look at the capacity of smallholder farmers in terms of their familiarity with platforms, digital solutions from um, uh, providing their produce to market, I think it needs to, we need to be quite clear that that's, that's really quite low. Um, so I think that's the first thing, because if your capability is already low, then the capacity for uptake and acceleration, scaling and impact for that specific segment will be a bit difficult. I think the second big thing to look at is really the digital tools, and that's the software and the hardware. Do they have the right phones? Or do, can they download the right apps? Um, are their phones capable of using um, on those apps that can, that can sometimes be quite dense? Um, and I think in the assessment that we've done, smallholder farmers, um, about 28% of them don't even have a mobile money account, right? And if you're looking at internet-enabled phones, less than 20% of Kenyans have internet-enabled phones. So when you're really talking about the type of digital capabilities that allow a smallholder farmer to play meaningfully um, in the digital market space, you begin to see that the digital software and hardware that they have access to can be a real constraint. I think the third thing is really the financial bandwidth. Um, Pre-COVID, if you looked at you know, mobile money, which everybody knows about, Kenya is known for this, but already over half of Kenyans said that the cost of mobile money prevented them from using it more, more regularly. And as we've seen incomes decline, as we've seen income shocks really hit you know, many people across the economy, smallholder farmers no exception, we need to understand that the narrowing financial bandwidth means that their capacity to either engage in the mobile payment system or even to buy bundles um, or airtime really is a problem. So even if they are very creative things, and we see this in Kenya too, WhatsApp groups and all these things, that does come with a financial bandwidth implication that, that I think has been compromised. Um, and I think finally, it's just the digital skills and capabilities. I mean, I think often, you know, the smallholder farmers are often seen as consumers of the, of the platforms and the products. And of course, you need a certain level of skill to do that meaningfully and to really have the ability to translate the vision of how you want to use that platform to actual capabilities to deploy the strategy effectively. Um, and I think the concern I have there is also who who, who, who owns the platforms, um, how many of those solutions are indigenous, um, and sort of the implications then, then of scaling um, going forward. So I think if we don't look at those very carefully, we will start to see income inequality more deeply married to digital inequality. And I think that's a reality that we certainly do not want to um, you know, see going forward. I think the final big thing that I have a real concern with is that people aren't really looking at the incentives to join the platforms. The assumption is that platforms are good and people want to join them. But when we look at, you know, different types of farmers, you've got the smallholder farmers, but you've already got, you've also got small farmers that do a lot of regional trade in cash crop economies, whether it's tea, coffee, you know, sugar cane. And, and sort of the work that we've done around platforms, sometimes there's no incentive to join the platform in terms of the risks linked to being on the platform, in terms of the perceived returns, but also the visibility. I think people don't understand that there's, there's, there's a comfort in anonymity, particularly when that farmer or that individual doesn't understand how their data is going to be used. Often the platform will sell, you know, oh, this will help your life, but you don't really know who's going to use it, how it's going to be used, whether suddenly you're going to start getting, you know, income tax questions. Um, so these are all really very serious things when it comes to understanding where digital solutions sit and play in how farmers want to deploy or deal with COVID. And then saying, I think until we really start to appreciate that demand view and understand the incentive structures of all these different types of financial solutions, why is cash still, still king, even in Kenya, where digital money and digital payments are far ahead of the rest of the world, cash is still king, why is that? And if we don't answer those questions, the real risk is we'll start pushing solutions and then it's to be like, oh, you know, these solutions, they're having problems scaling, we need to incentivize use. No, maybe take a step back and look at what are the incentives to engage in this platform? Where does a platform or digital solution sit in the ecosystem of how that farmer is operating, particularly in the, in the context of COVID? Yeah, oh, that's, that's a lot of good food for thought too. And what strikes me, um, because we've been looking at, at CGAP at platforms in other spaces, you know, the, there's the issue of how we use them today and how they progress over time, right? And there's a real power differential between the people running the platform and the people engaging in the platform. And over time, as we've seen, for example, with Uber here, you know, you, you've 
find people sort of having an initial set of benefits of being part of that platform and then it sort of degrades over time. And so I think that's a really interesting observation that we can sort of explore as, as we carry this conversation further because there's a lot of benefit as we heard from Chris and there's a lot that we can really um, build on from what COVID's brought. But I think, you know, we have to be mindful of some of the risks that come along with it. So thank you very much, Anzete. Um, so finally, I'd like to ask Ferdy um, to share his views um, from the vantage point of, of South Africa primarily, but also a little further afield in Africa. So Ferdy, um, are there any good examples of the use of platforms during the COVID-19 pandemic to monitor a fast evolving situation? We're aware, for example, that BFAB is actively involved in tracking the challenges in broader food systems, ranging from very well-developed um, value chains right down to assessing whether these value chains are working for food hawkers and other informal businesses selling food. So can we hear from you on, on what you're seeing in the markets you're engaged in? Sure, thanks Greta. Um, and um, it's a great privilege just to quickly talk about these examples. Uh, these are the ones in South Africa, but as I mentioned, um, you know, we had heard our colleagues now also talking about the examples in Africa, which are very applicable to what we've seen here especially in the informal market. So just briefly, uh, we launched this tracker about two weeks into our early lockdown, uh, where we really had major disruptions coming in, uh, being reported very quickly or shortly after the announcement of the lockdown. Uh, and that was despite the fact that agriculture and the food system was actually regarded as an essential service or essential industry. And what we learned was that how complex these value chains really are. So uh, we set up the tracker and we, we it was an online web, uh, web system uh, and we had an end-to-end -end approach where we requested CEOs or uh, marketing managers, uh, logistical managers to go online and report any level of disruption where we had a one being completely disrupted and a five uh, business as usual. And we, we split out the value chain to a typical upstream, midstream, downstream approach. And we wanted to, for them to report on logistics, material, um, and labor. In other words, on the input side, uh, can I acquire, can I buy my inputs, can I process it, can I sell it? Um, and through this tracker, we launched it to actually track, to, it would run the survey every 48 hours and really come up with a rapid response uh, system and provide that to government to make critical adjustments where we found uh, bottlenecks or disruptions, the major disruptions. And the, the interesting ones were really, or the important ones were really the, the laterals, the supply chains feeding into the food system. So certification of certain uh, products uh, where the, it was not regarded as an essential service and, and the certification couldn't run. Um, another interesting example, you know, in this period, South Africa is a major exporter of oranges and the food, uh, the, uh, the uh, construction of pellets, these wood pellets uh, that the orange, uh, oranges are, uh, need to, to export on these pellets and the packaging material uh, that was not regarded as essential service. Uh, so suddenly there was no material for the exports to take place, although the exports were regarded as an essential service. So through this very rapid response, we could actually pick up some of these bottlenecks uh, and capture vital information that we could send through the system. The interesting part being the spin-off came with understanding more the importance of the informal value chains. The street hawkers, for example, were completely shut down. They were not allowed to operate. Uh, which caused a major disruption in the informal food system. Uh, and you could actually then look at the retail numbers. The retail sales were going up by 15, 20%, and probably uh, the diversion of the supply chain where you don't have the lower income uh, population households uh, buying from the street vendors now not being able to buy there and actually having to revert back to the retail system. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. These are some practical examples that we experienced through this tracker system, the web-based system, uh, which has actually um, really, again, uh, illustrated to us the complexity of our value chains, the diverse nature, whether you have highly um, mechanized, uh, integrated, um, commercialized value chains versus your informal smallholder value chains. Thank you so much, Ferdy. So there's a lot of um, really interesting thought being put on the table. And one thing that strikes me um, 
from the conversation is that, that there is a lot of acceleration of technology, data, um, and, and rapid change happening in agricultural value chains. But I'm also struck by this particular topic um, being where the formal and informal sectors meet. Um, and that the formal sector is sort of dealing with all these problems and, and finding ways to sort of digitize. But you know, as Nzetsi said, there are some real gaps on the informal sector side and how you kind of knit those things together in the long term, where you end up building back better for everybody in those value chains, not just for the people who are creating the platforms. Um, and, and so I think there are a lot of really interesting things to dig into here. I thought it would be useful if we took maybe 10, 15 minutes um, to just have a discussion amongst the um, panelists to react to each other's statements or to put new issues on the table. We do have um, a number of questions that came in over the social media accounts. And so I'd like to get to those, but, but first I'd sort of like to give you opportunity to react to each other a little bit and, and see whether we can pull out some strands that um, are, are illuminating of, of the situation that's going on. So um, Chris, we started with you. I wonder if you have any thoughts based on what others have, have said so far. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really fascinated uh, in this conversation on, on two key areas, and, and, and uh, they're starting to come up really strongly here. I think, I think number one is about data governance. Uh, there's a huge concern here. What is the role of the government? What is the role of the private sector? And the private sector, of course, is huge and diverse. And, and having you know, experienced a lot of uh, my career in the private sector, you know, we have to also respect the private sector has invested heavily in you know, in developing systems for proprietary knowledge. I mean, if you're a trader uh, and, uh, you know, for example, you know, whatever product you're trading in, your knowledge is your understanding of that crop. Your knowledge is the understanding of forecasting, supply, demand, market. So, so all of a sudden, uh, there is an expectation you're putting all of this knowledge into a public space. And I think we've really got to sort of understand what is the role of regulation and government? Because government needs to make very, very good informed decisions, particularly at the time of a crisis. You know, we, we have to be clear, you know, wh where this sits. And I, I know that, that uh, you know, when it comes to the private sector, you know, everybody wants to act responsibly. Everybody wants to come together. But you have to start dis defining what is the pre-competitive space within data? You know, and that's a very broad expression. And I think that's where we, where we really need to drill down in. Uh, governments have actually been asking the private sector you know, for information because they know in some cases the private sector has more information than they do. Uh, you know, and so, so, go, you know, so, so there is a, there's a really awkward conversation going on here, what you back and what you support. Um, there's a lot of interest, of course, is that there are different types of data. You know, there's the detailed data of supply chains that the private sector is collecting as well as you know the public sector collects but then there's the bigger picture where we've got a lot of data like the world bank group has been working with various organizations even nasa who, who are doing all of the large-scale screening and you can get incredible data from screening and start forecasting you know what's going to happen with so and so crop that is a public good and we share that you know publicly for all and i think that's really important I think the other thing is I'll just stop on this next point. I, I think what, what what's been talked about here is is data. You know, is is the is the adoption of new technology. You know, I, I must admit I've sat in meetings, and I'm sure we all have, where the you know as as uh, as Annette has said, uh, the you know there's an assumption that people adopt. Well, they don't. You know, we we've had huge problems of of really trying to get people what we assume is a great way of reducing transaction, connecting people to markets. Then all of a sudden there's a blockage. I mean, I'll just, one little simple example. Uh, we've been working with farmers in Miramar on real small holder transferring funds and so on. And our data was completely confused. And, and we just couldn't understand, not just about adoption, but where the problem was. Then we realized that not just the problem which you said about handsets, but farmers were actually sharing handsets. So they had a SIM card and they would take it from one phone to another, you know, sometimes four or five farmers shared one handset. You get huge confusion. So, so there's a lot of areas to unpack on how we deliver technology, how we, how we scale up technology. And I, th I think I'll, I'll stop there, but two, two points I'd like to drill down on. Thank you. Yeah, no, and big, um, complicated topics, which we're seeing in you know, this data governance issue, we're seeing a lot of other areas and, and you know, what's public, what's private, and what, what does the consumer own or the, the provider, the smallholder farmer own of that data as well? And, and, and how are they part of the conversation? I think it's a really complicated space. Um, and Zetsu, would you like to come in and react on any of this? 
Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, absolutely, I resonate with a lot of the understandings of the complexity of the agricultural value chains and really looking at the more formalized value chains, the less formalized and where, where they meet. We saw the same thing in Kenya where, you know, the shutdown of trade actually had a back a back end effect on getting goods to market. And I think that's that's really been the, the a problem across the across the world uh, across Africa. I think something else to really think about is as COVID has, you know, allowed some um, farmers or players to become more digital and made it more difficult. I think the other story that we're seeing is how the shift from previously employed people into more informal gig spaces, including the trade of agricultural produce. You know, I don't know, you know, in many parts of Africa, there, there are people who have jobs, but they also have a farm or they will see, a, you know, a, a small piece of land there, and they sort of have that going on in the back. And I think as we are seeing, certainly the work that we're doing now um, in Nairobi and around Nairobi, we are seeing the previously employed coming into a space that previously was really quite um, informal with a lot of veteran presence in that space. And so I think something else that you need to bear in mind is that as COVID is shifting people in terms of their capacity to earn a living, we are going to see a crowding into certain value chains and a thinning out of previously veteran players that often are more low income, particularly women and youth who do not have the financial bandwidth, do not have the capabilities, being squeezed out by individuals who do have better skills, better capabilities, and a better understanding on how to interface their interests with the opportunities. I think that's the first thing. I think the other, the other big thing we're seeing is the, is the urban to rural migration and the impact it's having on food systems. You know, sort of, we haven't been really able to track that in a granular manner because a lot of the tracking of urban rules on smartphones and that, a, it tells an interesting story, but it's an incomplete story. But really looking at how the shift from particularly low-income urban individuals to rural areas, I mean, then how that will inform food systems into, into urban areas. So we are, we are beginning to try to, to get a handle of that. And I think the, the third thing that sort of links to data, et cetera, is that if the data isn't there, then you become invisible. And so the, the real problem that we're seeing is that often the, the, the smallholder farmers and the value chains that need um, the, the, the support and the policy and the intervention from state and non-state players aren't showing up in the data, often because they're not on these platforms. And therefore, those decision makers don't have information on how to better support them. So it's really, they're really in a very difficult conundrum of how do you make sure that they're seen in the data you know, while dealing with all these structural issues around why they're not being um, shown up in the data anyway. So I think we need to be a lot more deliberate, I think, in the points the others have made around making sure that we use COVID to ensure that the data capabilities of state and non-state actors are fit for purpose and that people are not ignored, um, unintentionally ignored, in, in intervention creation and in the deployment of strategy because they're not being consistently picked up in data sets because often those are the people that need the interventions the most. And then there's a whole separate issue of targeting. How do you actually then target? You know, because we've seen, you know, the gendered impact of, of COVID and we've seen particularly women in the retail space, right, these feminized sectors. And when you're talking about the, the trade of food products, particularly at the, at the micro level, household level, a lot of that is, 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 there's a very deep female presence there. So then how do you then ensure that you, you use data to target that sector efficiently? To the point that Christopher has made, a lot of people share phones, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of women share phones, you know, you know, all these things. So I think being a lot more deliberate and using this opportunity to ensure that we have data capabilities that are fit for purpose, that do not invisibilize people, I think it's a real opportunity there. Yeah, and I think it'd be interesting to explore the, the role of government in sort of bridging that gap, because I think there is a risk that you see this kind of acceleration of solutions, particularly in the private sector, and you have a bunch of people who are left behind who they don't even have the phones, certainly they're not smartphones, and, and you know, they don't have that phone on their own, so the data, as Chris was saying, is, is muddy, right? And, and so I think it is worth thinking as we kind of move through this and, and some of this stuff gets baked in as part of the system in the future, then what can governments do to sort of start bridging that gap? Otherwise, the exclusion gap just gets bigger. Um, Bertie, love to see what you have to say on the conversation that's um, gone on so far. Yeah, I, I'll maybe uh, just quickly uh, on Chris, uh, you know, I think you raised a critical point around um, the data that we, that's, that's needed and, and the role of public and private sectors. So, and we've seen this uh, 
also another practical example is, you know, South Africa, we have similar to the WASD report where you have a world supply and demand estimates. We came, that came through so critically in this period on projecting, you know, are we going to run out of food? That was the biggest question that many African countries, and I think across uh, the globe, there were many big importing nations that were asking these questions, and we saw this frenzy of buying and worrying of empty shelves, um, and, and we spend a lot of time in that space. And so obviously any kind of commodity and, and the cereals are uh, the easier ones to, to cover, to say, you know, we've got ending stocks. These are projected crops. These are projected consumption patterns. We have at least two, three months worth of stock levels, et cetera. But then you rapidly run into this shortfall of data, just having deeper insight on the availability of food. And it, it's a, old, a very old topic, uh, you know, food balance sheets, but it still remains so important. So we can have very fancy data, but we still need our very basic food balance sheets to understand those. And, and we've, we're doing quite a bit of work also in, in, in the networks with other think tanks in the African uh, region. And, and there it becomes a big issue because suddenly you don't have this deeper insights into stock levels, into consumption patterns, the volume of demand and actually, for example, uh, imports coming into the country, um, you don't have that insight. And that creates uncertainty and uncertainty also drives prices. So we saw these price spikes uh, driven uh, largely because of uncertainty. And again, the, the uncertainty is created to a large extent by the gap in data. That's the one point. Uh, and I think you're just investing in these data systems. And I think, Chris, I agree fully with you. There's a level of data that should be in the public domain. Uh, and it's, it has to be uh, in, the, in the space that we're working on, and especially in Africa, we have so much informal trade going on. Uh, private sector, one will have to figure out a way to incentivize or to build a, a, a system that incorporates the deeper insight. Let's call it the ground truthing of availability of stock levels of trade going on. Um, and, and that's the biggest challenge that we have is to really to integrate private sector into, into the space because data is so valuable in the African markets because it's not there. So the, 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 the companies that do have the data sit with an absolute advantage in trading on this information. So I think that's just from my side, a, a quick point to make. I, I really appreciate this idea of a public sector, private sector space. Uh, we're, and what is the data that we can really invest in uh, that, that helps us to under, get a bigger understanding of, of where these markets are moving and to, to reduce the amount of uncertainty in the market. That's a really helpful addition to this conversation. I want to drill down on that a minute and maybe put you and, and Chris on the spot. Um, because you know, you're know, you reminding us, Ferdy, of why agriculture is so unique. It's like what we eat, right? You know, it, like these food chains matter for a reason. And, and, and this is really sensitive for a reason because, you know, we need, they're complex and it, everybody in the world sort of depends on being able to get access to this product that's being delivered, right? Um, but you talk about sort of data as a public good and being able to monitor it. And there's this interface between private data and public data, right? And, and I guess the question I have for both of you is, are you seeing any examples of where governments and, and companies are coming together and getting it right? And, and does that give us any sort of um, insight into what that might look like in the future in terms of how we um, draw that line between proprietary, you know, important to the business data usage, but also something that's very much in the public interest and, and does need to be a public good. Have you seen examples where, where somebody's getting it right that we ought to be thinking about as this gets nailed down in the future, either of uh, any of you actually? Or are we out lacking examples completely? Uh, Chris, I, I maybe if you want to take a step from your private sector experience uh, and then I'll, I'll try maybe give some practical examples. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I, this is a very challenging point, and uh, Greta, you really, you really hit the nail on the head on this one. Um, I'm trying to. I know, I know numerous examples where there are challenges and things aren't going well between the private sector and the government. Uh, I, th I think a couple of other examples. Um, 
I think just, just not to divert your question, um, but I think one thing that was very, very important was when COVID crisis really hit straight away, uh, many of the governments started to respond on, you know, they internalize, they, they start closing in. You know, what, what's happening in my own food security space? And we saw huge challenges of the exports of rice from um, Asia. And I'm talking about India, I'm talking about Thailand, I'm talking about Philippines and so on into the international markets. And where a lot of that rice was flowing to Africa and some of the rice was flowing obviously into the, into the Middle Eastern region where there's a lot of food deficits. So those governments immediately started to look at, shall we shut down exports? Uh, and, and I think what people don't really appreciate about rice, I think rice is a really, really critical crop to monitor uh, for the simple reason that, that it's a huge global crop as we know, but only eight or 9% of rice is traded internationally. So as so soon as some countries start saying, we're thinking of shutting down exports, the price of rice can rocket up. You know, it, it, can, it can hit the market within 24 hours. So a lot of the, I'm not going to say private sector companies, the actual associations of rice importers across the world, uh, as well as other governments, even the World Bank, we, 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 we try to show strong evidence. There's plenty of food. You know, when the crisis happened, there was plenty of food. We just got to make sure the markets move so that the consumer is not disrupted. You know, we were seeing across the world here in the US, rice was flying off the shelves. Uh, because of the, the concern. So, so I think it's not just the private sector, there's a huge amount of layers of, of producer associations, uh, you know, all these consumer groups, you know, there was the um, Consumer Goods Forum was giving a lot of advice. We've done a lot of work with like the World Cocoa Foundation, the International Coffee Organization. So we look at them as, as areas of convening dialogue between governments and private sector. I think it was really critical uh, you know, we, we convened a lot of dialogue, particularly around the rice space, and in no time at all, the rice markets were kept moving, and the price was kept fairly stable. It spiked a bit, then came back down. I think those are the kind of interventions are critical, because many, many people, the urban masses of Africa, you know, you're Lagos, you know, you're Accra, you know, going across the West African continent, you know, from Abidjan all the way down into Maputo and Nairobi, they are very dependent on importation. Some of it's regional trade, but some of it's international trade. So if countries start looking inward and closing borders uh, or closing the exports, that's a major concern. The other thing, of course, was that borders started getting closed, uh, particularly in Africa, to stop the movement or the transition, the transmission of COVID. This had huge supply chain disruptions where crops were stuck at borders and so on. So, so there's a lot of detail here to unpack, but yeah, data, data, data. Governments need to be informed. They need to know, but they need to not just know national markets, they need to know international markets, and they need to take learnings and lessons and hear from these multiple sectors that specialize in that crop. So rather than making blanket decisions to stop an export, they need to say, why? Why should we look at this before we make a decision? So I'll stop there. Okay, Ferdy, I think you wanted to come in next, and, and Zetsi, if you want to come in too, um, but let's start with Ferdy. Sure. Um, I, I think the, um, just to link on to this rice issue, what was very interesting is um, we were actually on the receiving end of that, that trade crisis, Chris, because rice is actually the one you'll know in South Africa, we don't produce any rice, so we were actually importing rice. So we literally had to phone, and there are two major importing companies of rice, um, and, and there was no data available in the public domain uh, on uh, kind of projected imports of rice um, and the availability of rice. So we had to call them and the companies were very forthcoming. Uh, they didn't share, they, they allowed us to, to kind of to see some of their data uh, and we put that out of the public domain. We actually wrote a publication on rice and the availability of staples, maize, wheat and rice and explained that, you know, there's sufficient food coming in uh, and the companies were, were already you know, they were well in tune, they understood the crisis and they did it. But it just illustrated the impact for, for um, wheat and for maize, where there's a mandatory reporting mechanism uh, by, uh, in, put in place by government. Uh, we have supply and demand estimates, it was very easy. Uh, the information was out there, it was, uh, we were able to do it. Whereas for rice, it, it became very tricky. 
uh, to kind of, especially because there were only two or three companies. And I think this alludes also to the point that, uh, Anzetti, what, that you were making, uh, you know, where you have these bigger companies who already have the benefit of the data and information, uh, you know, that gap is, could potentially now become bigger. Uh, and that's something that we, we need a targeted approach and really to, to support uh, the transparency, transparency of information in the market for more market entry uh, to take place. Can I just add to, yeah, no, I completely agree with what everybody is saying. I think from a practical point of view in terms of the work FSD has done, although it's not necessarily in agricultural value chains, it is in finance systems. And the, one of the things that we've seen and we foster is that I think decision makers need to appreciate that they have to spend money on this. You know, and I think once you start demonstrating the use cases of how data is useful, it is a journey to get from um, government, governments understanding that they need it to actually putting budget lines behind it. And this one becomes a fiscal issue. I think we are in a situation where across African governments do not have the fiscal space for just about everything. Prospects for revenue generation going forward in the short to medium term are quite grim. And therefore telling them that actually you need to spend quite a bit of money to build up your data capabilities. I think that's gonna be a very interesting conversation to have. But I think when you do start demonstrating the use cases for data, that journey becomes shorter and easier. We've seen this in the work um, that we've done with FinAccess, where eventually we do have full government ownership and government you know, really starts putting money behind you consistently producing data sets. And I think just the second point I want to make is that the biggest frustration that I see is that those data sets are not produced consistently with a consistent methodology. What you see a lot of in Africa is snapshots pictures in time, but being able to trace data sets across time and really understand what's going on behind those numbers is a real concern. And so as a result, both Chris and Freddie have mentioned, data really becomes a tool and almost a, it becomes a, a, an asset that is then curated for certain, for certain objectives. And I think we need to get back to data being a neutral public good and understanding that there is a need for that um, capital to be deployed for data to be produced as a public good. Otherwise, we will continue to see this hyper curation of data for very specific um, ends. I think the third thing that I think we need to really start to, to, to look at quite seriously is when we're talking about recovery, we need to start looking at the role of finance in that. And not the role of finance, just in the supply of it, but in, in, on the demand side. One of the biggest concerns that we're seeing is domestic demand has fallen off a cliff. So you're seeing a hyperaggregation of demand for basic food items. And so to the points that Freddie and Chris are making, you're seeing a, conf a, a confluence of factors in forward, informing the increase in the price of food. Part of it has to do with food not being able to get to market. Part of it has to do with imports being cut. But part of it has to do with the fact that limited finances are now being deployed to very specific food items. So as we're looking at the macroeconomic picture of how these food value chains are being affected, it's really important that the fiscal and monetary space is monitored quite, quite seriously. Because you may find that headline inflation is fine, but when you start looking at key food basket items that are important to the bulk of Africans, you start seeing very particular pressure there. And then when you start looking at the, the other exogenous factors that we've got going, locust invasions, floods, and all these other things, going around food basket items, I think you begin to appreciate the need for um, up-to-date um, data that is not curated for, for, for certain objectives. Thank you so much, Anzetsi. Does anybody else want to come in very quickly on this? Because I'm mindful that we need to move on to some of the questions that came in. Okay, if not, I'm going to um, now move into the questions that came in over social media. And I'm going to direct three questions to each of you, and then we'll have some more open questions. So, um, Anzetsi, um, most smallholder families are quite subsistence focused, particularly in Africa. Um, they seem the most vulnerable and many of such farmers are women. Um, there's a need to focus on the vulnerable segment as well and you've spoken a little bit to that, but what I'd be interested in um, hearing from you is more around the solution space, right? We've talked about how there's a problem with people being excluded from digital platforms. What, what can be done to incentivize um, the use of digital platforms, particularly, particularly among these more vulnerable populations uh, for women's smallholders and, and others who may be um, less comfortable um, engaging with digital platforms. What, what are the solutions that might be out there? 
Well, I think we need to start with asking whether platforms are something they're interested in or would be of use to them. I think we need to put them in the center and really begin to understand where they sit in terms of how they view their priorities and where they see digital solutions sitting in that, if at all. Um, so I think for me, the first thing is obviously looking at re, um, re, uh, helping them to restructure and to recongregate their informal networks um, systems, whether that's informal finance systems, informal information systems, where they get a lot of information about markets, where to sell, how to sell, um, and getting their households back intact. Because one of the things nobody seems to, you know, really appreciate, there's a there's a fleeting understanding of it, but really the shift of unpaid care to women during the COVID crisis has been substantial. And so when you're looking at the capacity of a woman to really come out of the house when the children are home from school, God knows when the schools are going to open, and her capacity to then do her usual farming activity, get that good to market, and really make the money that she used to be making. We need to really start looking at the domestic space and how it interfaces with the capacity of a lot of smallholder farmers to make money. And an important part of that is to help the informal financial mechanisms that women have, helping those come back, and then help with the informal network systems to allow women to be economically productive. So I think separating you know, the, the, the gendered impact of COVID from the link to economic productivity is a very dangerous one. And I think we need to reweave the reality that unpaid care, and we're not even going to talk about the increase in physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse that a lot of women are facing. Smallholder women are no exception, right? how all of that is going to start interfacing with economic productivity. And I think an important part of that is asset depletion. When we did the gendered as, um, analysis of COVID, obviously female farmers are far worse off in assets to begin with. So when you're talking about the capacity of using farming assets to buffer um, and the ability of women to come back by dipping into assets to refinance whatever agricultural activity that they had before, there's a real problem. So I think really looking at the assets that women have, and we've done this, we've done work in FSD Kenya, it's online, we did work on segmentation. We looked at where um, um, uh, farmers, said, we, we segmented it a bit differently, but there's a gendered aspect to it. We looked at where farmers are in terms of their financial health. We looked at how they tend to save. We looked at the digital solutions they tend to deploy. Those are really important to see because you'll begin to understand how they naturally tend to behave financially and how they tend to organize their economic activity. So when it comes to rebuilding, it's looking at, okay, where are their assets and how do we support them in ensuring that they are able to really recover um, in, in, in what is a very obviously multifaceted challenge. Great. That's very thought-provoking. Okay, so moving on to Ferdy, I have a question from John Mindy from Agrifin. How do we build institutional capacity to manage and interpret smallholder farmer data sets and digitization efforts to make rapid, real-time, predictive, evidence-based decisions, both public and private sectors, to respond to both productivity and food security shocks? Uh, thank you, Greta. That's a very good question. Uh, and, and I'm afraid, like all things in life, uh, there's not a silver, there's a silver bullet to, to solve this very quickly. Um, but, I, but I'll give some exa examples, um, and we actually saw that uh, in, in the recent events for African swine fever in South Africa, um, where initial um, incent or, or initiatives uh, focused really on a very comprehensive, a very detailed survey, um, and, and when, when private sector and public sector really came together and they sat down and, and this was pri private sector actually initiated this, uh, this whole drive of making things much more focused. Uh, we talked about focused early on in our discussion saying what are, what's really the information that we need to get this thing under control. Um, and then you narrow down and you focus, you ask yourself, what is the key information that you need to make certain policy and business decisions. And, and this, for this space, it was specifically on African swine fever. Uh, and, and making it uh, where you start off with a questionnaire and you want to know everything about everyone, everywhere, and, and you actually figure out, you know what, you actually need with the 20% of that level of detail, you can actually get to 80% of the answer and understanding, because that's really what we need, is we need a ground level a ground truthing system that's always in place, not an ad hoc system, but something where, where you have this information, this intelligence always on the ground 
at a certain level of information that's sufficient enough for you to move for critical policy intervention. And I think that's, that's maybe my, uh, the, a key learning that we've had in these last years with our data science unit is that data becomes so complex and we have got a, this huge amount of data flowing in. One needs to take a step back and say, these are fancy tools, uh, but what are the key questions that we want to answer? and keep that in, in place and system. You know, a, a basic functionality in South Africa, we've had many debates around, uh, you know, Statistics South Africa only surveys uh, VAT registered farmers. You know, we, we are missing smallholder farmers in our, in our registry. Now there's actually an initiative going on. If we would just have an understanding uh, of where these farmers are, what are their ba what's the basic information, and you could do it, do it actually very cost effective. And where the private sector then comes in, and, and, and Chris, you will definitely be able to help on this, is most of these companies have certain programs around corporate uh, investment, corporate social investment programs, impact assessments, socio-economic impact assessments, and there we've done quite a bit of work where uh, companies, private sector companies want to actually measure and understand what is their impact on the ground uh, in terms of socioeconomic impacts and they want to tell that story. Well, you know, that's to the benefit of the company, but turn this incentive around and make it to the benefit of access to data and work in partnership with government. And, and with, before you even notice it, if you focus on the right questions, you bring private sector, you, you acknowledge their need uh, that they want to show impact. Uh, impact is always good to understand. And I do believe that some of these companies really want to make, an, uh, make a difference on the ground. Uh, so get that in, in, in step or kind of in sync with your government developmental goals. And I think there's a, a space that we can work with. Great. So, Chris, I now have a question for you from Matt um, Shachowskoy from ISF Advisors. He asks, um, there's an increasing interest in open data initiatives and the right type of incentives to unlock data for more private sector oriented service providers. When it comes to open data platforms, who should be investing in this data collection, curation and analysis in the short term? And what is the long term role for governments in playing a neutral enabling role in the longer term? Wow, what a question. That's great. So uh, thanks very much to Matt for that. I, I think we've actually touched on quite a few of these issues in our conversation already, but just you know, to also, you know, to always reinforces, you know, data, data is transnational, it's global. It's not, it's not just about, you know, the Pacific country. Uh, governments have a huge duty in knowing, you know, what is happening within their own uh, production systems. If we're talking about strictly about agriculture and food, agribusiness approaches. The government has to make drive decisions. You know, there's going to be deficits. They have to make decisions to import. They have to make decisions on where to invest. And I think um, Anita has, has given us this really, really important point. And, and, I, and I, I would like to really verify and strongly say that governments today are not investing anywhere near, near enough that they need to in this space. They, there's a lot of startup activities that are still required before you get into a steady state. Uh, I think what's really important to acknowledge here is that you know the world bank itself uh, our clients are governments and uh, obviously we work strongly in emerging economies in the agriculture and food local space we we lend out or promote or push out to governments about three and a half billion dollars a year across the world across multiple areas of agriculture investment rural development and so on and that's complemented obviously a lot by our infrastructure colleagues etc so this is the agribusiness side out of that there is an increasing requirement from governments to allocate uh, loans uh, funding that we supply into the data collection space. So I think that's a real positive point. And the governments are also saying they want technical capacity, they want support in building that space. They want to understand better what the public good is. But also, you know, we also know the World Bank is a World Bank group. We have the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, and they've set up an I. Okay, it looks like we lost Chris there. Let's, um, let's keep moving and we can bring his um, comments in when he is able to rejoin. So let me ask uh, an open question to all of the panelists while we wait for Chris to come back on. Um, 
so this is from Will Saab, also from ISF Advisors, and he's asking, what kind of value can these digitized um, tech technology-driven platforms bring to this space? For whom could this create value? Can this be monetized? Who could and should run these platforms? Is this a private sector function? Is this government? Is it shared? Um, you know, we've seen examples in the payments space and in the financial sector space where we're seeing very new mashups of public and private participation, most notably um, you know, what India has done in terms of building public infrastructure that's driving both identity and payments. And that's really changing the game in terms of how the financial sector is evolving in India. I wonder if there are um, parallels in the food space and, and how we should think about that division of labor between public and private sector in, in building these platforms. Does anybody want to have a crack at that? Did I come back? Oh, there you are, okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Sorry. Yep, I can hear you okay. Do you want to finish your thought? And then we had a very thought-provoking next question. Yeah, I heard that question. I'll just, just to complete what I was saying, and I apologize for that. I think something went wrong with my internet here, but it's back. Um, you know, we even have problems in the US. Anyway, so, so ju just to turn around and say, you know, I, you know the importance here about the, 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 you know, the international global, global uh, agenda. Um, just building on the point about the investment in the public side of data, which is really critical. There is a lot of dialogue now going across the World Bank Group with support of the private sector, support of governments. We're doing a lot of convening in this space. And governments have a huge desire to work in partnership with the private sector. They don't see that they see the private sector as an important ally, an important resource. You know, they've got to bring the data from the private sector into the public sector sp uh, space. Uh, we're looking strongly here now, of course, on data regulation for data privacy. Uh, the private sector that has been working with its suppliers or its partners and so on uh, is now very strongly willing to give aggregated data into these global platforms. You know, maybe not the detail, but aggregated data is good. Uh, all data is good as long as that data is credible and verifiable. So I think it's really, really important to, to realize that there's a lot of positive issues happening in that space. Um, and um, anyway, I, I, you know, I'll stop there. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, um, and, but, but I'd like to come back to this question that's been raised and it builds on what you're just saying, Chris. You know, how, how does the public and the private sector come together in, in some of these data governance issues? And it's not just data governance around the privacy and protection space. It's really, well, what data are we gathering? And is it consistent? Is it comparable? Um, there is a real role for government there. Um, you know, who, who should be driving these platforms? Can and should it be monetized? Um, and, and, you know, who should run them? What are the roles of the different players there? And I was giving, I don't know if you caught this, but I was giving the example of what the Indian government has done with ID, with um, the unified payments interface, where it's basically um, privately owned, but the impetus for it was driven by the public sector and it's purposely kept very open. So whereas in, in a lot of markets where you have these private sector driven solutions that are winner takes all, I'm Amazon, I own the whole market, or I'm M-Pesa, I own the whole market. This is built for competition, right? But, but it requires cooperation in a space where you don't normally have it. It requires setting rules, it requires setting governance. And I wonder whether there is a similar sort of um, space in the agricultural space around these platforms where government has a role that's very important to play and the private sector has a role that's very important to play and, and what's, what's purely private and profit making and what is public good and where do we draw that line? Is it something we draw globally? Is there a role for the World Bank or is it really country by country? Um, you know, and then you have problems about whether the data is comparable. So I, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that because I think there are a lot of interesting challenges on the data governance side that this um, raises. And, and, you know, we've had this massive disruption. So how do we think about going forward? Open the floor to any of you who have a view on that. I'll just throw in very quickly that, you know, throughout the many, many years now, we've all got used to working with the FAO uh, data when it comes to agriculture, agricultural production. Uh, I think they do an incredible role in the way they collect data through all their field offices, and bring that data together. The data is tested regularly. And I would say that within sort of levels of variance, I mean, it's pretty effective. Um, there are of course other very, very good data sources from USDA. Uh, the American government has been incredibly good at uh, collecting data, but these, these areas have, have taken years to build the networks, years to build the methodology and huge investments. So I think we should be looking at how do we build on what we've got 
rather than something new. Uh, I think that's my message at this point. Does anybody else want to comment? Mm. Yeah, just coming from uh, from a finance uh, from a finance perspective in terms of agricultural finance and some of the creative stuff I think is happening in Kenya that sort of starts to grapple with, which is a very difficult issue that you're raising there. I think being um, more flexible in regulatory requirements, particularly in inception stages, is very important. So that private sector that do have creative ideas around platforms data that, that haven't been tested, can, that can happen in an environment where the consumer is protected. So in, in Kenya, for example, we have the, the regulatory sandbox. It's only ran out of the Capital Markets Authority at this time. But I think that's the sort of ethos that I would like to see um, happen in, in areas such as agricultural finance. Because the real risk that we're seeing is just what you say, where the whole point is to drive efficiency, but the flip side of that is the hyperaccumulation of value by single parties, and then sort of what that means for competition. So even within government, I think one of the things that we are seeing around things like regulatory sandboxes is that the different arms of government that need to speak to each other actually start speaking to each other. Because I think by the time you have a situation where data is being um, produced as a public good or a certain platform is being produced as, as a public good, different arms of government have interfaced with that solution. So I think things like sandboxes really create a very useful way to start looking at the type of supervisory oversight that's required. And the, bit, the easiest way to get regular data is to make it legally required, you know, but then that only deals with the formal side, the informal side still, you know, is, is sort of the sand. And I, and I would really like to echo um, what the others have said around, we have seen in Kenya, and I would encourage this to continue across all African markets is a disaggregation of informal economic activity at least on an annual basis. Um, we do see the quarterly figures come out. They're not necessarily disaggregated by formal and informal, but I think, you know, if we can regularly on an annual basis begin to see within the informal sector what, um, what segments contributed what and what their performance was, we do start um, beginning to see the ability of subnational presence of that, you know. And I think the World Bank's been very important in helping subnational statistic um, um, Gov agencies really begin to play the role that I think um, you know they, they could be playing. Greta, thank you, and Thirty, yeah, please come on. Yeah, I, I think uh, one dimension uh, that I just quickly wanted to add to to the private sector space is actually the industry organisations. Um, you know, they play a very important part because it it at least gives uh, this one uh, arm, arm's length away from a private company uh, which has its own goals and its own drive but once you get together as a, a forum or a industry organization um, there suddenly you know and, and again there are competition rules and, and competition commission acts uh, in many countries that uh, you know should regulate carefully how the the information flows and there is no um, risk for collusion, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if industry organizations do actually quite a good job in, in countries where they're functioning well, to be some of these, to generate actually a lot of data across the sector, uh, and even more so some of, if they're really well organized, they create these forums. Uh, that you find where it's not only at a certain, let's say, producer level, but you actually have a, a, a oil seed forum or a, a cereal forum, uh, and and those forums become the space where where private sector and and government actually interact, and 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 I think they also where where ro the role of the World Bank and and FAO comes in very critically is to within these, these forum spaces where suddenly you don't have this the, the the challenge around one specific company disclosing data or positioning itself in a certain way but rather a a, a organizational platform creating the aggregate level of information that's required for a transparent and a well-functioning market because at the end of the day in these industry forums you quickly realize that uh, and, and it's not hard to tell or to figure out what is the state of information that we need for a uh, for a market to work uh, effective as effective as possible uh, and transparent as possible at least for for people to enter the space uh, and and you know if you have um, closed system of information, it quickly comes out in these forums 
people will, you know, they would say, but guys, we don't have this information and who has this information? And, and suddenly you have this just a much more open debate going on. So I just wanted to add that dimension to our thinking around information platforms. So I'm going to have one more question for general discussion, and then I think we probably need to wrap up because we're almost at time. But um, we had a question in from Michael Okpara from the University of Agriculture in Umudike Abia State, Nigeria. Um, how can we make data collection and generation effective without taking a closer look at the study area and local context? How is this possible when we capture from a distance? Can we really fully utilize or digitize data collection off our study sites? Is there a role for partnerships in data collection and use due to this conundrum? And I think that question is really interesting. It speaks to the point I think one of you made on sort of uh, demand side data on, on the informal sector and matching that with what you're seeing from the, the supply side. And, and so i um, wondering if anybody wants to jump in on that particular question. I mean, I could start. I mean, I think the reason I ask the question is because it's expensive and difficult, you know, and I think one of the, the things I have been seeing coming out of COVID is that people are beginning to understand the need to appreciate and better gauge demand depth in African markets, you know, and I think that's been alluded to by Freddie and Chris. And so when you're looking at whether it's a food deficit situation or whatever, one of the biggest clouds that sort of does that is where people eating the food and, 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 and is the demand there. So I think, I think in order to do that, there's no way around it. I think money has to be deployed in the spirit of development finance, uh, public sector and private sector were appropriate, particularly through the association structures. We've seen that also in Kenya that, 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 that Freddie mentioned, and that people need to appreciate that that is work that has to be done so that the base level that I think everybody is alluding to is consistently provided. Because I think one of the myths that is beginning to emerge is that if you have a certain corner of the data market, you're good and you can use that ad infinitum to make money. But I think what becomes clear very quickly is that if you don't have across value chains, if you can't do that um, across time, and if you're not speaking to the other sectors of the economy that affect your specific data little bubble, um, you begin to see the limits of the usefulness. So I think just really what everybody else is saying is that the practical um, need for collaboration on data is something that needs to continue being encouraged, um, you know, and, and, and doing the work of having subnational presence. <laughs> you know, and building the capacity of, at subnational level to collect and analyze that data. Do either of the other two of you want to come in on that, Chris? Yeah, I, I, think, I think this is really important. Obviously, we want detail, detail, and detail. Um, but, but that is really challenging to get out to all of these massive, you know, land areas and connections. So, so obviously, data, um, the way we're connecting through the digital means and through interviews and so on is there. I did say that I was really concerned about the lack of ground truthing this year. Uh, there's always ground truthing going on in terms of random samples on the ground and so on. Uh, the World Bank has been doing, you know, supporting a lot of household surveys in the past. Obviously, that, that is going to be a void at the moment. So we have to look at when are we going to get that back into the system. But also, we have to look at, um, you know, going forward with the new digital connections being strengthened, how we add a layer of credible surveying into that because what we've got to do is be inclusive and the biggest concern here is people with resources get counted people who don't have resources are not counted they're not brought into the policy debate they're not brought into into to all these areas so so i think this is going to be really important um you know on on the approach uh, the other thing is just just to say uh, we, we we got so concerned about some of the data we actually manage um working with associations as Ferdy pointed out which is so important we managed to get the associations to link us with smallholders through mobile phones. And we did a pretty detailed uh, household survey through a phone as opposed to going. So set questions and, and we got a good consistency of replies and that helped. Not perfect, but we have to persist and try. So phone surveys is something which was new this year. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, Ferdy, the last word to you. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, I think I already made them a point that, you know, it, it's so expensive um, to really get down to the ground level stuff. So um, I think it's just absolutely critical that we really carefully think about the data that, that 
we do need uh, to at least have an intervention at a very specific level. Um, and then, uh, you know, put the information out there. We had an interesting example. I was thinking about, you know, doing things from space. Uh, and we had this flyover done in a number of our provinces, a flyover data beyond agriculture mapping of, you know, what's happening on each field and doing remote sensing, but also just mapping infrastructure uh, and what do we see from the air and it was very cost effective and and when the agriculture department actually put that data onto the website you will be surprised who were the biggest users of that data it was more in terms of the log just logistical planners and suddenly this data becomes alive i think the point also that we made is if you're just in this little data bubble uh, you don't uh, appreciate the gap if you look a little bit beyond your just your fence or your bubble of data availability and actually put it out there and, and you get much more use and interaction in your data. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. Um, I, I'm going to struggle to sum up this very rich discussion, but let me um, try to draw out a few strands. And, and what I'm really struck by is just how similar this conversation has been to conversations I get into all the time in the payment space and the financial sector space. They're, we're all wrestling with similar issues. And I think where that's kind of coming from is that this increasingly integrated digital economy is challenging in so many ways the ways we always used to do things. It requires competitors to collaborate. It requires sort of a redrawing of the lines between what's the public space and what's the private space. And how do we define those new rules of engagement? It's almost like we need a new kind of social contract for how we all want to operate in the, in the digital economy. I think there are really interesting um, comments that came out of this on, on what that line looks like between the public and private sector. What is something that only the pri public sector can do? What's something that only the private sector can do? And then how do you come up with the rules of the game, the data governance in the space that sits in the middle? Um, and, and you know, how is this disruption of COVID going to change the way that we have that conversation? Um, I'm also struck by com comments that Ansetze made about, you know, keeping our eye on the ball of exclusion, you know, this fast acceleration that we're seeing in digitization and in data driven um, decision making, you know, how, how are we thinking about people who might be left behind? How are we making sure that everybody gets brought along in that? How are we making sure that we put supply and demand together in the pictures that we're drawing? Um, I don't know that we came up with lots of answers, but I think we've raised the right questions and to answer them, you have to have the right questions. So I think this has been a really useful conversation. So I'd just like to close by thanking my excellent um, panelists um, for this discussion. Um, Chris Brett from the World Bank and Zetse Ware from um, FSD Kenya and Ferdy Meyer from, I'm gonna forget the name of your um, outfit, but I'm gonna go look it up, um, from the, Bureau for Food and Agricultural Policy in South Africa. So thank you all for being part of this very um, interesting discussion. For those who are listening in, we will be sending a link to the recording and thank you very much for joining us.